All right, uh, it's 8 p.m. GMT, and it's time to start our webinar on vector symbolic architectures and uh, hyperdimensional computing. So today, it is my great pleasure to welcome uh, Yulia Sandomirska from Intel Labs uh, in uh, München, right? And uh, she will continue our uh, a topic that we started earlier uh, this summer. Uh, she will be talking about grounding of symbols in dynamic neural field architectures. Interesting. So I mute myself and I uh, leave the floor to you, Yulia. Thanks. Thank you very much, Evgeny. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm looking forward to discuss this topic with you. Um, I, I will start with very basics. So I will kind of lay the ground and explain why and how the symbols can and maybe should be grounded in something like dynamic neural fields or attractive dynamics. I won't claim that I am, will be complete in my explanation in my story or that I will present the most recent results. In fact, um, now in, in my group at Intel, we haven't yet touched this topic of you know, grounding symbols. We are um, preparing and the basis for that and the infrastructure at the moment. But I, um, very soon we will come back to this topic and, and we'll move it forward. So I think for me, it was a very good kind of moment to put it all again, the thoughts together. Um, let's see. I have to show this little legal disclaimer to just go over it. So the first to get started, uh, when we talk about you know, vector symbolic architectures or symbol manipulation, we're talking about something that biological neuronal systems do, you know, as humans do. Um, and, and one thing to, that I think is important to keep in mind is that those neuronal systems evolved to control movement. Um, I hope we are on, on the same page here. And if not, I'll be happy to discuss this point uh, later, whether it plays a role in how we process symbols, whether it's important or not, we can discuss that. Um, but I think we can take it for a fact that the neural systems over time, they evolve to enable movement in the environment in order to get food, in order to you know, get, the, get better offspring and the whole story of the living um, beings. So if you now think for a moment, what does it take to control a movement? Uh, we can think about it from you no know, artificial movement perspective. So let's imagine we have a robotic system that we would like to control. So what, what is kind of happening around the system and what needs to happen inside the system in order to produce movement? Um, so imagine we have you know, some robot of your choice and preference. Could be a mobile robot, could be a robotic arm, could be a robotic dog or a humanoid. These robots have a multitude of uh, different sensor channels. They might have a bunch of cameras and they might have different cameras. They can have conventional image sensors. They can have you know, those neuromorphic novel event-based sensors. They could have you know, some microphones. They sometimes have tactile sensors, IMU, some joint uh, sensors. All the sensors deliver some signals about the environment. And those signals are of very different nature. You know, some are images that come you know, synchronously 30 times per second. Others might be events that come one by one at a very fast succession, you know, a million times per second. Some might be you know, auditory signals where the temporal component defines the signal. Uh, in others, temporal component might not be that important and, and the spatial patterns um, define the signal. Um, some might be you know, some complex and multidimensional signals. Some might be one dimensional signals. Now our internal controller system, neural system needs to create some kind of representation, immediate representation of the environment around this you know, robotic agent or biological agent that will allow this agent to plan the next couple sec seconds of movement and maybe further ahead if it's a more advanced agent, but at least a couple you know, seconds ahead. Um, so in order to create this coherent representation, um, this neural system needs to have some properties. And I have this picture of, you know, this blind man touching the elephant. So this is a little bit like the, 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 the people who touch the elephant are all those sensors. They deliver some bits and pieces of information. And our neural system needs to imagine the elephant behind that. So it needs to build this uh, representation of what is happening around me now so that I can um, act in, in this environment. Um, and, and so what, what is um, required to uh, enable movement generation in this system uh, what, what people have discovered is first creating multiple feedback loops because our sensory channels work with different time scales um, and, and because they might require some you know some control and some active component in that perception we might need to create multiple uh, feedback loops uh, we might need a hierarchy of uh, maps to to in the end set, uh, fuse all the sensors in this coherent representation of our elephant um, in the room and we need to form memories on different spatial and temporal scales in order to integrate all that information 
that comes on different um, spatial and temporal scales. Um, so what um, like our you know, group or, or um, kind of our field, the field of studies, so our approach hypothesized or, or establishes is that in order to, to build system that can build this kind of representation, the neuronal controller needs to um, have attractive properties. Um, so very briefly what the attractive properties are, and, and then I'll, I'll slowly go into explaining what it all has to do with symbols. So as I, I'm pretty sure all of you know, a, a tractor is a state of a dynamical system that is controlled by the dynamics so that if some perturbation or some noise try to kick out the system out of the state, the forces that we have created in our dynamics will just drag it back into the state. So it's a stable state of the dynamics. Um, so in, in dynamical systems, that just means that the dynamics can be described by the simple uh, equation. Um, in neuronal terms, because we are talking about those neuronal controllers, um, in order to create such an attractive dynamics, we can take a neuronal population and wire it up in such a way that it creates stabilized activity patterns. Um, and, and these activity patterns, uh, you know, they, they are stabilized, so they can bridge different time scales. We can link them to all those different sensor types uh, with different sampling in time. And then we can also link that to the, this population to a uh, motor system in order to control movement. Uh, but, but the basic pattern is, is very simple, right? We have a population of neurons and we wire it up in this typical um, you know, winner take all or dynamic neural field fashion that would be the simplest possible um, or the simplest usable uh, attractor network. Um, and in our uh, work today at, at Intel and Neuromorphic Computing Lab, um, we start using these attractor networks as building blocks and building architectures um, out of those. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the, the basic uh, motivation or statement um, of this talk. And we can discuss it at the end, that in order to um, generate behavior and, and generate cognition to, to generate um, you know, thought and simple manipulation in a behaving system, uh, we need to make our controllers attractive dynamics. This is the only way how we can link them to the sensory surface and to motor, motor behaviors as well. Now, if we think about uh, symbols, with, with these um, ideas in mind, that the neuronal systems that produce symbols, they came out of um, necessity to move around, to produce behavior. Then uh, one, could, one could claim that the, the very origin of symbols is in the system that can produce behavior. So let's have a look at the simplest possible system that can produce behavior, um, a Breitenbach vehicle, right? A simplification of a simple reactive agent. The Breitenbach vehicle right, has some body, and in this body there are a couple of sensors, a couple of motors. The sensors can perceive something and can discriminate something, for instance, light, um, and, and in a the simple case that Breitenberg was thinking about, um, the sensors can perceive more or less light. Um, and then depending on how much light they perceive, they drive the motor respectively, right? And then Breitenberg has discussed all these vehicles that you could, can implement that can produce different um, behaviors of different complexity just by wiring up sensors and motors like that. So we can build systems like that, that will uh, link sensors to motors one way or another. It can be a very simple way, can be some more complicated way. You can have a deep neural network in between if you want, but the um, kind of the essence of this uh, behaving system will be the same. It will be like reactive system, like a frog. A frog through its deep learning convolutional network detects a fly and you know, stings a tongue and catches it. Reactive system, there's some input, there's some output. Uh, but we can hardly talk about any symbols being uh, like existing here, uh, but that's a system that can produce simple reactive behavior. Now, if we want our system to survive in a slightly more complex and, and challenging life situations, um, then, uh, yeah, let's, no, let's not, not talk about survival just now. So even this very, very simple systems, we can abst abstract or model mathematically um, a, a simple attractive dynamics. So where um, the, uh, like the fact that I have detected a fly, I can stabilize this, this, um, this event so that I can direct my action towards this event. But when it becomes a little bit more interesting is if, if our frog sees two flies and now needs to decide which one to catch. Um, so now there are multiple potential targets. And now our system needs to somehow represent the fact that there are two different targets. And maybe these two different targets are attractive in a different way. So instead of just having the single variable dynamics that describes our behavior and you know, where is my target left or right, 
and which can then drive the motor uh, reaction immediately. Now I, I have a need to somehow represent um, this whole space of possible directions where the fly might appear and be able to represent a couple targets that are out there, you know, two or, or three. Um, and, and my motor system now needs to go through a decision process where it decides to either pursue one of the targets either randomly or because one of them is maybe more attractive, maybe it's slightly closer. If the targets are very close, it might decide that I don't have to decide between them. I just go you know, in that direction coarsely and will catch one of them. Um, so out of that, th there appears a need to introduce um, not just a, um, a variable on, on which we define our dynamics and where we create attractors, but introduce the whole space of such variables and defining a function on top of that space. So define, defining some activation function that will reflect some kind of saliency of my perceptual inputs or um, certainty in my decision to, to go left or right or to do some motor decision. Um, and now what, what happens um, in dynamic field uh, theory is that in, in this space of possibilities, um, I, I put a certain type of dynamics on my activation variable that creates these attractor states that are stabilized and that can drive behavior. And, and here I think we make the first step towards having something symbolic um, represented by neuronal system. So first having something represented at all, name, namely the, uh, kind of the variable heading direction or some, some other variable with all its possible, possible values. Um, and then encoding in activation patterns that are localized activity peaks, um, different um, kind of specific instantiations of these variables uh, that have some, some kind of symbolic discrete nature. Okay, and in order to do that, we need to, to add uh, recurrency in our neuronal architecture. So now it's not just about input and output relation. Now there's some interaction in our neuronal system or the controller that creates some loops and creates some stable states and attractors. No, and, and we go in the realm of neuronal dynamics, of stable states, of some kind of symbolic processing that still stays grounded and linked into sensory, sensory surface. Um, okay, so a couple notes. The first note that this type of dynamics we can uh, implement in neuronal terms. And I think it's quite encouraging because that tells us this is something that could actually run in biological neuronal system uh, because we can implement it in neuromorphic hardware that the, where the only algorithmic tool that we have at our hands is the simple neuronal model. We have neurons, we have synapses. Um, so we have shown early on how one can implement these brighter back type uh, dynamics with some stabilization of attractors for target acquisition or obstacle avoidance in neuromorphic hardware. Um, right, and, and, and you can have this little robots like embodied agents actually drive around an environment, uh, solving a simple task of avoiding obstacles and, and going to target. Um, it's, it's not a very you know, complex symbolic behavior, but it, has, it makes one step towards something symbolic because it um, represents the, the target or the obstacle and can hold this representation long enough to you know, execute the action of going towards this target obstacle. Now to make it one, one step more interesting and maybe you know, getting closer to something even more um, symbolic, um, we can look at the following task or the following problem. Oh, I see now it's all over the place, my animation, sorry for that. Where are my pictures? Um, okay, let me just show, show it here because here at the very beginning of this movie. Um, uh, okay, I lost two pictures. Um, but imagine, uh, let me do some hand waving. Um, imagine you have this robot and it's going towards the target. Um, and, and then there's some obstacle on its way. So, so it turns away and loses target from sight. Um, now, if it would store the orientation at which the target was in the um, image reference frame, it would be pretty useful because when it uh, useless, because when it turned away from the target and lost it from you, this image based representation lost it, its value because it's you now the robot drags it uh, with it. So if it would use the direction at which it saw the target to, to go back to the target, it won't be able to go back there because it needs some allocentric representation of target. It cannot uh, just use the image-based or you know, um, sensor-based representation for forming something like memory. So it needs to do some kind of reference frame transformation before it forms memory to be able to use this memory under different conditions. For instance, when I look forward, but also when I look to the left. In order to use the, the memory, um, I need to form the memory when I look forward that um, kind of will be kept invariant when I turn. 
So basically, before we form a memory, no idea what happened with these animations here. Oh, just not there. Um, I, I need to do reference frame transformation. And this reference frame, frame transformation uh, is usually a very simple thing. I, I didn't store it um, on, on the computer, right? I just need to, to take uh, the memory in my retinal coordinates and then subtract my current heading direction. So if I, if I go forward, I will have certain heading direction compared to my you know, zero, head, zero heading, like north. Um, and I need to do the subtraction. Now, the question is, how do I do subtraction neuronally? Um, and it happens there's a little architecture that I can build with neurons that will allow me to do reference frame transformation. Um, it has many, many names and many instantiations, but, but um, in, in neuronal terms, I need something like a gain field that will uh, take as input on the relative target direction. So the direction to the target in my image coordinate frame, in my egocentric coordinate frame, and will also take as input my own heading direction, where am I heading now, uh, will combine them in a certain way and will um, use the mapping from the combination of these two values to the absolute target direction. So my heading direction, independent target direction. Um, and in our neuronal field terms, it looks like a little architecture that allows me to do this operation. So if I see um, you know, something to the you know, 20 degrees to the left from the center of visual field, then I will store this target um, uh, depending in, in different kind of positions in my memory, depending on where I am looking when I am, when I am uh, seeing that object. Um, and I can use this, uh, this architecture or you know, this structure to, to do reference frame transformations and to bring my memories into a more invariant reference frame. And this, again, brings me one step closer to something more symbolic, more abstract. I abstract away from my immediate sensory surface. I don't store memories in the immediate uh, reference frame in which they just came to my mind, uh, but I store them in more useful, more independent and invariant uh, reference frame. And again, we have shown like this mechanism, you can put it on your morphic device. So it's plausible that something like that could happen in um, uh, biological brains. Now this reference frame transformation, they can be used in, in, in different contexts. It's really like a little operation that I can apply to different tasks. So another example that I will go through now uh, goes even one step further into uh, symbolic realm because now we have language mentioned here, spatial language. And special language is a little bit special because um, um, it's easy to see how this type of language is embodied and, and situated because this is a language about spatial relations between objects. Something being to the left of something else is, of course, very kind of spatial uh, and embodied thing, you could say. Um, so just a little example. So we have this uh, very old robotic um, um, agent from, from, from Bochum long time ago, we give it a task. So it observes a little scene with a couple of objects. Um, the work is from pre-deep learning era. So the objects are very simple, can be distinguished by, by their color. So if the user defines a reference object, then it can pose questions to the robot. For instance, what object is to the left of this red object? and would like to know its color, you know, its identity. Or it could ask the other way around, say, hmm, this green object, where is it relative to the orange object? Or, or even just where it is, and, and the robot has to select the reference object itself. Um, so, so this is already quite a you know, symbol-like uh, looking task, simple processing-like looking task. How can we do it with these neuronal populations and this very um, distributed and, and continuous representations? So in order to do it, let's break down what this task entails. So our robot oversees a scene, and in the scene we have two types of objects. One is a reference object, another one is a target object. The target object is the one we want to talk about, and the reference we are using to relate our target object to. So what our robot needs to do mentally is to shift the reference frame to center it on this reference object, and to do this mental shift of the reference frame. Um, and then it needs to apply its notion of different spatial terms, something being to the left, to the right, above or below, have, has certain semantics in space. And the semantics can be expressed like the activation values. So again, similar to the previous salience activation. So if I say something is to the left, then most probably I meet this leftness relation, but maybe slightly off this diagonal is also fine. And if something very far, then probably I wouldn't say that it's left. So there's certain semantics to these terms. So what my system now needs to do is to anchor these uh, templates, the spatial language templates on the reference object, and then let just you know, activation develop um, 
under two inputs. One is you know, the target, the location of my target object, and the other one is the um, spatial terms. And then they will overlap. Um, you know, the attracted dynamics or the normal integration, input integration dynamics will make the decision for um, the right term to select here. Um, so this is the, the architecture, the neuronal architecture that allows us to do this reasoning about a scene like that in terms of identities of objects and spatial relations between them. So what components do we need to solve this task? We have our visual input. We split this um, input into a color channel um, and, and put it into a three-dimensional attractor network, so or a neuronal field. Two dimensions are just space, you know, the retinal space, and the third dimension is the color, which is our identity, our label for the object. Um, so we show here three slices of this space, the slice for red objects, the slice for green ones and for blue ones, and, and we connect and, and note to them. So this note really is something like that looks very, very much symbolic. It has some semantics, so it projects in a certain way into this three-dimensional space, but it's a single note that represents the, the concept of red, green or blue. These nodes can be activated and they boost the slice um, of the respective color so that now activity can form there. This active supra threshold activity bumps can form in, in this field. Um, so if the user says, uh, where is the red object? The red neuron will be boosted. This red part of the three dimensional field will again get a boost and will form a peak on the location of this red object. Now, depending on of whether I ask where is the red object or which object is relative to the red one, I will boost one of these uh, two fields, the target and the reference field, and of defining the, um, the quality of, of this object. Is it the target or is it the reference? So this activation will flow either to the reference field or to the target field, depending on which one of them is boosted. And I'll talk about these boosts a bit later. So if my target field is uh, subthreshold has low resting level, the input that comes to it from the threat object won't have any effect. Uh, if I, however, boost it with uh, uh, you know, some homogeneous input, then now the red input can have an effect and can form a peak and select the target object, which is the red one. Um, then I have this uh, reference frame transformation that brings the reference and the target object in the correct reference frame. Um, so target object in the reference frame of the reference object where I can apply those spatial term um, kernels or templates and combine this all to solve all these different tasks. So I'll show you three, three examples how these single architecture can be used to ask different questions to the system. So imagine this is a system of nodes and neuronal fields, so like a neuronal network that can be used in different directions. I can provide input to these guys, to the color nodes. I can provide input to these guys, to the spatial term nodes, and the inputs will just converge and, and then the outputs will come out on the other side. So there will be the three examples. The first one is the where um, question. Where is the green flashlight relative to the red tape dispenser? The second one is the what question. What is above the blue deodorant stick, like waiting for the color answer? And where is the green highlight where the system needs to select a good reference object and, and also the, um, the spatial term, the where term? And, and here you can see that the blue object is a slightly better reference because it's in the more kind of canonical relation to the this green object than the red one. And all this will automatically be taken into account just by defining the shape of our templates and letting this competitive uh, attractive dynamics do its job of selecting the best, the best item. Okay, so example number one, there will be a little movie, the things might happen quickly, but now you know what will be happening. So this is our where question. So we'll see the green thing going up uh, and the activation of the green object going into the target field. And then there will be relative to the red one. So the red uh, node will go up and the red object will give its activation to the reference field. And then we'll see how the answer, the spatial answer emerges. So the green one goes here, then the red one goes over here, over there. And now we have these two objects. The, this one just computes, put, puts one of them in the reference frame of the other one. Um, and now this, uh, the activation from here to the nodes goes over the spatial templates that have this different shape. And this template was overlapping best with this left node, I guess, right? Because in this reference frame that is centered on the reference object, this object is to the left. Okay, now the next demo is what is above the blue object. So here we'll see the blue object going up and then the blue thing going here in the target. Then the above one of these nodes will go up and we'll see the shape of this kernel kind of visible here. And then it will propagate to you know, this reference field and the color field and we'll see one of the colors selected. 
beyond that goes. So we have the blue object goes here, the reference object, yeah, what is above the blue object. Now the aboveness uh, is propagated over here and now you know, it's propagated over here. And, and in this field, it overlaps with the actual object and these two, it doesn't overlap with anything. So when these nodes are boosted, we can have the answer, the red object is above the, the blue one. And the final task, the most challenging one, where is the green object? We don't give the reference object. We only give the color of the target object. And then we boost both the reference field and the spatial terms and just let them figure out what is the best candidate both for the reference um, and for the spatial term. So the green object is here. And now there's a boost to all of these guys. So with all candidates uh, templates and they all kind of go into this field and the best overlap was with blue objects. So the answer will be, uh, it's you know, to the left or to, to the right of the blue object. We can have the answer and there's an answer for, uh, for the blue field. So as you see this, this um, single architecture, you know, it's um, you know, situated and connected to the sensor surface. It constantly receives this input. Um, we can orchestrate it. We, we need to orchestrate it a little bit and I'll talk about this orchestration in, in a second. And we can let it solve different like seemingly um, looking like symbolic processing tasks, uh, reasoning about the scene. And, and we can discuss how, how symbolic that is. So I'll, I'll be happy to put it in discussion. Um, the interesting thing about the, this architecture, so a colleague of ours has, has used this to actually model behavior of humans um, in the spatial reasoning tasks where people get like little images with different spatial arrangement of objects and they need to name the spatial arrangement. Um, and, and the spatial arrangement is not always perfect. The shape of objects is being changed. Some of them are longer, then you're maybe more probable to say something is to the left of this object than above this object, and then when the object is horizontal. There's a lot of um, you know, science and, and statistics and, and just data um, about this type of task. And, and this type of model could just account very well for all kinds of behaviors. So that's kind of encouraging. Um, and the second nice feature is that we have implemented this model on, on the robot, on that Cora robot, and have shown that indeed we can do these judgments about the scene and can talk about the scene uh, while you know, constantly receiving update of the scene. And for instance, the um, like at some point the, the camera will start moving and the robot can start reaching for this object. Another thing that we can see here, there are two red objects and the task here is to you know, take the red object. So that part of the task is given first. We can actually look at that. So you see that, and, and there are two red objects. So first, the, the larger one of the two red objects is selected, but then the user gives additional information. No, I want the one to the you know, left from the green one. So this additional information, the left from the green one comes into play and the decision is uh, changed on the fly. So you can see how the system reasons about the scene but is constantly open to new information that comes from the user and can um, change and, and adjust its um, decisions on the fly. So it stays connected to the sensory surface at all times. All right, um, so remember when I was explaining how this architecture worked, there were these um, boosts that I was mentioning. We, we either give some input to this node and then we boost the target node. So behind the scenes, there is some kind of uh, behavioral organization of this architecture happening. So we, we, we boost some part of the architecture, we give some input here and there. So there seems to be some, some kind of an executive controller uh, acting behind the scenes. Um, and indeed, so in one line of this work, we have postulated that whatever behavior our system is doing, and, and the behavior could be avert behavior, like moving my arm, it could be simply a perceptual act, I want to see and find the red apple on the table, it could also be some internal process, like I'm going through my thinking process, um, and all these um, behaviors, so acts, are, are organized by what we call elementary behavior, and elementary behavior is a structure, in our language, a neuronal structure that has two components. One is intention and one is condition of satisfaction. So intention drives the behavior and it can be, again, avert behavior, it like makes my arm move, or it can be some covert behavior. It just sends some reach that biases all the red objects because I am looking for my, I don't know, red earring. Um, so everything red is more interesting to me or could be, you know, the shape of my keys. So it can bias my perception or it, it can, for instance, boost that reference field because I need to find the reference object first, some mental process. And the condition of satisfaction checks when am I done with whatever that intention was trying to do. Because remember, we are working in this attractor world. So whichever state I create uh, in, in my downstream system will be a stable state. So the system won't leave this state. 
uh, you know, by its own will, it will just stay there. The state is not driven by some some external sensory input. It's um, you know, internally in the generously generated state. So we need to release the system from the state when we are done with whatever we are planning to do. So when my, um, you know, red field is boosted and I found the red object, I will activate the condition satisfaction will inhibit my look for red object intention. When my arm has touched the glass that I wanted to grasp, I'm, I'm done with reaching. I can um, inhibit it and can go on to the next behavior. So this is an important component of all this you know, symbolic processing because all those symbols, they're created, actuated, and then deactivated um, kind of actively by endogenous uh, processes. Which, of, which is stabilized. And now you can play around with this module. So we can arrange them. So first we can have many such elementary behaviors for all kinds of different acts that we want to do. And these behaviors will be linked to perceptual and, and motor planning system. Um, but so the intentions might activate some motor plans, might influence and bias my perception. The condition satisfaction will monitor, maybe for my motor state, maybe for my perceptual state. All these links potentially you know, are plastic and maybe subject for, to experience-based uh, learning. Now, I can organize these uh, elementary behaviors into sequences. I can organize them into some fixed sequences because I've just learned this is a good way to do things. It's my habit. And I always you know look for Apple before I grab it grab it. Um, and, and in some cases, there is just some logic to these behaviors that I, that I learned. So if I want to grab an, uh, an apple, I, I better first move my uh, hand there and don't start just, just trying to grab it when my hand is not there. Um, so there are different ways how I can create and organize sequences of such behaviors. Um, so very, very early, we have shown how this can actually be practically realized. And on simple examples, so remember, it's like 10, 10 years, at least, this work. Um, so we would build a little architecture with different behaviors, um, behaviors for, for this little Nawa robot. Right? Nawa cannot do much, but it can look around. It can look at objects. It has cameras in its forehead, actually. It can move its arms, and it can grasp a little bit, uh, not very, in a very sophisticated way. So we can have two kind of uh, microscopical behaviors. One could be grasp, so find object, open gripper, go to the object, close the gripper, we grasp something. The other one could be point. So find object, close gripper, go there, and then open the gripper in a pointy movement. Um, so we would uh, create different behaviors for you know, these different components. So one would be find the object of a given color behavior. You know, it specifies the color which you're looking for. The color will be connected to this 3D color space field. Uh, bias it so that I can find the given color, and this color will then drive movement of my head so that I look at this um, at this color, right? Move head. Um, no way. I, I also want to monitor where my hand is, so there's additional behavior for that. Open grip is a very small and simple behavior. Move arm is a behavior that moves my arm to position that is defined eventually by by the place where I am looking. Um, I have some visual surveying for some fine control of my movements, and then at the end I can close gripper again, very simple behavior. Um, and now I can organize sequences of this behavior. So I can define some, some nodes that I can activate or deactivate that will um, kind of create uh, contingencies in this space of behavior. So for instance, I first find the object and look at it before I do anything else. So looking is a precondition for all the other behaviors. And the open gripper, can be a precondition for moving arm if I am in this grasping behavior, or it can be, um, or the um, close gripper could be a precondition to moving arm if I am in the point behavior, um, and so on. And we have now shown that it works. So if you are interested, right? So we would have this whole behavior running on the robot, so it will open, it will try to grasp. And again, you can um, intervene, right? And you can, for instance, move the object away so that you destroy the precondition. The uh, robot is not looking at that object anymore. It will stop, it will find the object again, and only when it's looking, it will continue moving. In this case, it will discover the object is now in the other half of the workspace, so it will select another arm to move and, and grasp this object. So again, you see, so we created the system. It has some kind of symbols. It has these objects and different behaviors that can be activated and deactivated, but it's constantly linked to, to the actual sensory surface and produces behaviors. Now, uh, to add a little bit more level of complexity. So before we had a system for behavior organization that can generate actions, generate sequences of action. What if I also want to be able to perceive actions and, um, and, and sequences of actions? Does it change anything in the system? And it does a little bit. So it makes our elementary behavior slightly more complex because now when I perceive the action, 
um, I might make a mistake. So I might think that I perceive you know, a reaching action towards an object A, but in fact, uh, my, my hand doesn't stop there, uh, but it continues moving. So it was reaching for something else. So instead of just having you know, intention and condition of satisfaction, we add condition of failure. So when I build some hypothesis that I'm perceiving action A, but it was not confirmed by the you know, final sta stage of this action. So I have a condition of failure. Um, otherwise, the same, the same system can also perceive sequences of actions. Now the next, and then it works. So we have shown again many years ago in a lovely European project that it works. So you can you know, move your hand around and the system will recognize different behaviors. These guys, they show when I recognize different behaviors. It's difficult to, to parse here, so we won't spend much time here. The next question is, if I have the system of elementary behaviors, can I learn those sequences? And, and of course I can, uh, for instance, with reinforcement learning. In fact, those elementary behaviors, they help me to discretize my state action space. So in reinforcement learning, it's about learning on an agent that makes different actions in different states and gets rewards once in a while. And based on those rewards, learns value of different transitions. For instance, if I'm in state A, is it better to do action B or C or, or D? Depends on how much reward I have gathered in the past by, by doing like one or the other action. So one can um, kind of put this whole reinforcement learning machinery on top of this um, elementary behaviors and again we have just shown that it works that you can learn sequences of actions with the usual um, hassles of um, reinforcement learning that usually requires many many repetitions of the task so we have shown that if you do some kind of shaping so you go from simpler to more complex tasks like you teach animals um, then it becomes more feasible to actually teach the system something useful um, another aspect that comes on top of that, if now I want to plan some sequences of actions, so I, I have a goal state and I want to figure out what sequences of action will bring me to that goal, um, I can also do that. And again, it will um, add a little complexity to my system, not much actually. So I still have my intention and I still have my conditional satisfaction. I also still have that precondition that defines um, kind of from which state can I come to, to the current state. And additionally, it now has a motivation node. Um, and I need this motivation node to do planning so that when I plan, activity spreads among motivation nodes. So I really want to go there to my target. And then it spreads this motivation. So I also want to be now in these neighboring cells and in the cells around them and around them. So the wave of motivation propagates until it reaches my current position. And then the motivation starts activating intention. So now I can start going on the trace of my motivation and, and, and reaching the goal. So again, we called it simultaneous playing in an action and have shown that it works on this, uh, this simulator so that you now you can plan a sequence of actions and then if the, you can start doing, executing your plan and if uh, the environment changes, for instance, the past passage is blocked, then I can do replanning on the fly just because my motivation wave gets cut. It's not um, updated, it dies out, so I have to search for another path and then the robot does another path. Um, yeah, and we have a bunch of uh, preaching movies that just show that. So they show this wave of motivation being spread from the target location to my current location. My current location is here in this corner. Uh, and when it reaches that corner, then I start moving um, in, in this field. And then at some point the passage gets blocked. Um, and so I, I move in the other direction. And there are four of these fields. So, so now the complexity is that now when I have this little unit, this elementary behavior, I need the whole sheet of these units that defines the space and the rules according to which I can move in this space. If there's no wall, then I can go in any direction. If there's a wall, then one of the directions will be cut. So there will be no connection from one of these motivation nodes to one of the uh, precondition nodes, in fact. So I kind of encode my environment um, in, in these connections between these modules. And I have four of them. Like here, you can see I have four for four different elementary movements, which are north, east, west, uh, north, south, uh, west, and east. Yeah, so so a whole story behind. But, but uh, the point is that um, I can plan um actions in in this paradigm continuously so here we can see the motivation and and precondition wave is spread this is my intention this is my conditional satisfaction um so at some point um the intention right starts moving and then the the passage is blocked here so the motivation dies out and then reappears in the other direction so if you if you, if you look carefully it's fascinating that it works i won't be able to explain it so quickly here 
Um, but basically, these, these waves of motivation and attention and precondition, um, they are there, you know, they're stable, they can guide action, but they also constantly can be updated by, by changing uh, sensor information. Okay, let me look at the time. I cannot look at the time, but I should. Um, yeah, so I think I will basically stop there. I will skip this newer and also very exciting stuff that again shows that you could put these kind of um, architectures on neuromorphic hardware. One note that I will make on neuromorphic hardware that um, some of you might, might know it, Intel, we have this new hardware and we like to benchmark things with this hardware. We like to show how well things work, how well different workloads and different architectures and algorithms work on this hardware. Because that's our you know, bread and butter to, to prove to Intel, like, look, our hardware is great in doing something. Um, and we have made this plot that shows um, how much better things run on this neuromorphic hardware that kind of replicates in, in spirit, like in, in form, in structure, the, the biological brain. So how much more energy efficient different workloads run uh, on Loihi versus other hardware systems? Um, and how much faster on Loihi versus other systems? So you see some of the workloads, they are 100,000 times less energy and 1,000 times faster. And those are these workloads that are in this corner. And if we see which workloads are in this corner, those are all the recurrent networks. So the structure of the recurrent network that is at the core of those attractive dynamics seems to match very well the architecture of neuromorphic hardware, um, which for us um, that makes it the promising direction to, um, to explore neuromorphic hardware as a computing substrate for such architectures, which, which we believe are useful for all those embodied tasks. Okay, so, so to, to summarize, in very practical terms, these attractor networks or dynamic neural fields, um, at the very least, so what do they enable compared to conventional um, neural network architectures, deep learning architectures? And, and the first thing that they enable is memory, because when you create an attractor state, you create a working memory state. The state is uh, is conserved over some time, and, and that's the memory. And this memory is required, right, for action planning. In order to plan an action, I need to keep the representation of the environment around for a little bit, even though, you know, I make saccades all over the place, maybe micro saccades, and maybe someone touches me on the shoulder, I still need to keep some representation around. It is also required for learning, especially if I want to learn on the fly, not just have my training session and then just use my neural system for the rest of my life, but if I want to do continual learning, I again need to keep my states around so that I can then later when I get a reward or punishment, I can do some credit assignment. And context-aware decision-making, when I want to make decision not just based on the fact that I see a fly right now with the corner of my eye, but also based on some history um, of my life, at least a couple of minutes back. Um, the second thing that it does is attentional filtering. So by creating the stable states, um, one component is stabilizing the state, but the other component is inhibiting the competing states. And this inhibiting competing state gets rid of destructors, potential destructors, noise amplifies the signal. And that saves energy and resources, so I don't need to represent and process those destructors that are still there, but I just suppress them and I don't care about them later in the architecture and filter out noise. Those stable states are also critical for any motion control and also flow control in an architecture because I need to keep the, the stable state and wait for it to have an effect. Because if I create some neural state and it is gone 100 milliseconds later, I might not be able to move my arm and reach its goal. Uh, if I just just uh, if I don't take care that those states are stable, it helps you to bridge time scales, and also in in this framework, in, again very practical terms, we create transparent neural architectures, so we know exactly what each module in our architecture is doing, uh, and it's much easier to you know assign different functions to this uh, module and to get something like explainable AI, where I don't just have a bag of neurons that does awesome things, but I don't know how and why and when it will break, but I really design their architecture in the control way. All right, so this is my pitch. It may be a bit long for a pitch, but I hope you could keep it in your working memory enough to have some critical discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia, indeed, for the excellent talk. Um, we will open, or I will open uh, now the floor for questions, but maybe I, I will use my position as a moderator to start asking you the questions. I have plenty of them, but I, um, I want to select a couple to, to, uh, for starters. Uh, first of all, I, um, uh, while listening uh, uh, to your talk, so I couldn't stop making analogies to what you 
do with neural fields and uh, symbols reasoning and what we are discussing in this community so vector symbolic architectures uh, and such uh, so my first question is whether uh, you made such parallels at some point uh, so this this was my first question but then i want to keep on shooting a couple of more questions so that you can answer all, the, all of them together uh, so the uh, the second question is a little bit more technical. Uh, so um, talking about symbol grounding here, uh, I mean, do I have a correct understanding that your symbols are kind of implicit here? So you do not derive uh, representations. So it's more kind of you, I mean, you do have symbols, so obviously, so, but uh, I mean, you do not have kind of, no, Common representations between the uh, between the agents. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. So how can you comment on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's go one by one. So first, uh, VSA versus DNF. We definitely, you know, see the analogies there, and we have quite some discussions in our group. So, so as you know, you know, Fritz Zoma is, is in our group, and Alpha Renner was working with me at INI. And he's probably the person who knows most about that because he set as one of his goals to, to show how you can have this neuronal field like attractive dynamics um, in VSA language. And, and Alpha finds VSA language attractive because of its uh, representation capacity. Um, of course, if we have um, these neuronal fields, no low dimensional continuous spaces, and we represent you no know, symbols and entities with um, activity peaks, there are only as many of those different peaks that you can you know, pack in, in this architecture, usually a relatively low number. Um, so what we, I think, believe is that limitation in the how many peaks you can pack there has some, some reason in, a way in, in the physical world, because if we want to kind of read out this representation robustly, uh, when they were created under noisy conditions, then we do think that this limits the representation. And, and just for analogy, in a, in a vector symbolic representation, you potentially can store much more um, no values and patterns. But if you now uh, take into account these patterns are created with some noise on them, and, and later I want to kind of fish out them reliably out of this mixture, that again limits the num uh, amount of patterns that they can actually, actually um, store robustly and reliably. Um, so, so I do see that there is some, some analogy in these two representations, and I'm pretty sure Gregor will have uh, maybe stronger and more clear opinions on, on the differences and the kind of dividing lines between them. Um, yeah, but, but there, there's different some analogy. I will maybe answer the second question. And then Gregor, if you, if you want, you can, you can comment because I think you have a more clear and sharp <laughs> opinion, opinion there about this uh, kind of dichotomy about these two representations. So where, where the analogy breaks and where we kind of part ways. I think there's some way where we, we, we have very similar um, kind of structures and assumptions and at some point the, the ways part. Um, and, and maybe maybe one need kind of both, right? Because in the dynamic field theory as we have it now is a bit limited to um, low dimensional representations that we believe underlie processes um, behind which working memory is there. So kind of the processes that take place when you close your eyes and you think about stuff, you remember stuff. And those are usually rather you know, vague um, representations. So those are not so sharp as precise representation of your face. For instance, if I close my eyes, I won't be able to reproduce someone's face uh, with all its details and all the features and all the uh, complexity. Um, however, somehow we are able to store those long-term memories of things and tons of things, um, and, and we don't know how to store them in this attractor um, framework, I would claim. I think Gregor might have stronger opinions there. Uh, concerning the representation, so I do think that we have um, representations um, as much as it gets. So in, in the field, no, we, we have the peaks and those are just working memory things. Then we have the concept of pre-shape, which is you know, some adaptive property of neurons, I would say. So the neurons that are under the peak, they change their properties. So now they are more excitable for this input, or maybe they're less excitable for this input. So there are also these three layer architectures that create kind of a draft um, in, the, in the resting level of the neuron. So I can habituate to some, some inputs. Um, and then I can store patterns in weights that lead to some nodes. And now these nodes start representing 
you know, something, and they can also represent conjunctions of different things, like, you know, the object is round and red and, and big, and that would be some kind of a concept. Um, and now sharing this representation is probably a separate question of you know, communicating with someone. Uh, by communicating with someone about something that we both observe, we could agree on, on some representation and create some shared um, representation. I think in our language, this is um, usually not about the knowledge-like thing that is just stored somewhere offline. I think it's more about the situated cognition. So some common representation that I create for myself to plan my next two minutes of life, or maybe even two seconds, um, and the one that I share with someone with whom I communicate right now. So it's more about the representation that I create in my head for my immediate action and interaction. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, yeah, you answered my questions anyways. Uh, so um, please, anybody else, uh, unmute yourself and uh, speak up. Maybe I would uh, call on Alpha. Maybe you can comment on the, on your view on this um, interaction between neural field attractor dynamics and vector symbolic architectures, because you're the one who does some hands-on work with both. <laughs> There are probably not too many of us in, in that category. Yeah, I mean, I would be happy to comment on that at some point. <laughs> at the moment, <laughs> I'm unfortunately not prepared to, to really give a good answer for that, I think. But I think maybe I can, we can give a talk at some point about this topic also here in this. Uh, That's excellent. This so now you give an idea yeah. about uh, our winter session. But I come to, uh, I come to this topic a little bit later. So, so uh, yeah. So, so just one comment for uh, yeah. Um, so um, I think on November one I will actually talk about these vector function architectures, and I think there I will address this. Uh, I think there there is a very clear um, relation between these extended VSAs, where you basically can represent functions hmm. by the vectors by the VSA vectors. And um, so I think I will definitely touch this topic. I, I will not say anything now because I want not to interrupt the discussion. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. and, and I posted a link to an event that we are having this week on Thursday. Um, it's organized by, by Intel. At Intel, we have this group, Cognitive AI. Um, and there's uh, a researcher there, Joshua Bach. So we had very inspiring discussions with him about the future of AI and, and cognition and, and representation motivation. So we're having a panel discussion about representations. So we'll talk about different approaches to these you know, concept and what it means and what is missing in today's AI on representations and, and how to bring them in. So feel feel free to join will be open free discussion mm -hmm. yeah i I'm, i could take up julia's uh, invitation to comment a little bit on please on this issue if you if you want uh, so i've gone back and forth oscillating in my opinion and so i'm not sure if i'm in the final oscillation or not ever since ross actually drew my attention to vsa i've always sort of uh, thought well are and even if you just a way to another way to do VSA style computation, as Ross suggested, or not. And so I've gone back and forth on that. And so um, there, there sort of in my mind, there may be three issues here. So, so the, the in DFT, dynamical field theory and neurodynamics in general, we, we're using localist representations ultimately. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that we need to organize the interaction so that it can stabilize just any pattern of activation, not only learn patterns of activation, right? The, 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 the classical idea is always if you, if you want to keep activation around without the input, you need to have your connectivity that keeps it around sustained or operates on it. And that um, is solved essentially by Hopfield kind of net networks for patterns that you've learned. But if you want to have that flexibility of being able to, you know, for the first time, see a certain combination, let's say of feature values, um, you'd have to have some kind of general substrate for that. And the fields you know, provide that kind of substrate. And of course that's very limiting. Uh, and, and we've worked on, uh, I'll comment on that, We've worked on um, binding multiple different localist representations like that, and then they become somewhat distributed 
in, in we bind through space or through a shared dimension, a label dimension, for instance. But it's still it's a lot of localist representations that we put together that as a whole doesn't have these powerful properties of high dimensional vectors, I believe. I mean, uh, unless there's something I, I haven't yet understood, it's, it's possible, but I don't see that happening. So my old view was that the uh, you know VSA idea didn't solve that problem because it, it didn't have an idea of how to keep these activation vectors around. When it was just done mathematically, that wasn't a problem, but when you want to really do that in the brain or you want to do it in your morphic hardware, I felt that there was a problem. And then of course, there is this naive framework of Chris Nysmith that suddenly seems to do that. So to be able to keep activation around and, and keep the activation operating, actually it's passing it from one population to another, and um, and so without seemingly the need for localist representations, and I dug quite deep into that, and I actually now think that that is possibly a technical solution, but it is not neurally realistic, and this is somewhat controversial to say that, and I you know can't be totally sure that I'm not making some mistake. So in my understanding, what the, the reason why in, in if you implement VSA with the SNAF framework, why activation can be passed you know, from population to population and be kept around and, and the, the contents be kept around or transformed is that the connectivity in the architecture is always informed by the about the initial encoding. So you initially encode you know, some, something into the random vector. And then when you, uh, let's say you have a vector somewhere that is some X you now, and now you make a, a architecture that computes X squared. So it's just a trivial example, right? And, and these are different neurons that now represent x squared. And the trick in these in, in NAIF is that you are uh, determining the connectivity between those neurons that represent x and those neurons that represent x squared by computing first, you know, the decoded original, you know, decode the population with the x and then re-encode the, this population uh, for the x squared. Of course, you don't really have to do that. It's just mathematic. And mathematically, that's what it amounts to. Uh, so, so which which means that the connectivity in in a large network is not local. It, it is something that really needs to be informed about everything. <laughs> uh, what was it encoded? I think that's technically fine. I mean, it, 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 it apparently works. I don't know if that has any drawbacks technically speaking, uh, but in the brain, I don't think that it's possible to do. And, and it's, it's in, in, for, for a lot of reasons that one can discuss. So I'm not thinking of this as, as a viable alternative. So even though I would love to get that flexibility of this a kind of algebra, we actually decided to try to do all of that by hand. So not having these powerful high dimensional vectors, but we, we do binding and unbinding and uh, we do, uh, you know, passing of arguments. Now, this is the important thing, the passing of arguments. I understood these things. I learned these things from VSI, I should say, and then I translate them in my own language. So for us, passing of arguments is, is a much more work, you know, much harder work where uh, we have some ideas, like, for instance, using grounded representations to do that. And uh, it's, it's complex. And all that price is to be paid, I believe, because of that problem of, of having the interaction structure that can keep information around and operate on it. If there's not some secret trick that I don't understand so far, <laughs> then that is a real limitation. And so we even not think that maybe you know, human brains are limited that way, that they are, you know, they have attention bottlenecks for everything all the way up, which make a lot of sense for, for all kind of binding. And I, I actually have come to think that the powerful kind of associations that deep networks can do, humans can't. Uh, we just have some very specialized <clears throat> uh, parts of our networks that deal with the high dimension information automatically, but there's no real cognition there. It's not really something that we're, that we're free to operate on. Now, again, I've been oscillating. This is where I am in my oscillation currently. <laughs> you know, maybe next year I'll have the opposite opinion. <clears throat> Could I jump in with a suggestion here? The, um, uh, mm -hmm. I often think of bindings in VSA as being the equivalent to a, a virtual neuron. So if you have 
the two atomic vectors A and B. So you know, A is some direction in the vector space, B is some direction in the vector space. So the binding AB, I like to think of that as a virtual neuron. So A defines the receptive field of that neuron. So basically when it receives the pattern A, if you then query that binding with the probe A, that releases the value B. And then the B uh, I interpret as the identity of the neuron. So, uh, mm. and that has, I mean, apart from being selective, it also means that you can create those things on the fly. Um, but so you, you could probably, I hope, with crossed fingers, uh, create something like a, a dynamic field in that, you know, if you wanted the, uh, the receptive field of some particular neuron, localist neuron to be its neighbors, then the, the, you'd create the binding between the sum of the identities of the, uh, the neighboring neurons, and that would be your A term, and then B is, is whatever. Right. Yeah. Uh, now, that probably is not particularly useful in terms of um, your sensory fields, where most of the things seem to me to be inherently low dimensional spatial representations, but it might be of some use uh, as you're sort of moving away from the directly sensory and you're getting more into sort of the, the planning sides of it. So, yeah. you know, I wonder whether, because I think I got the impression, and this is probably quite a wrong reading from, from Yulia's uh, talk, that, you know, you could say, oh, we're using DFT to do the sensory processing. And then at some point we'll hand off the representations to, to VSA to do some other more cognitive stuff. But I think it would actually be interesting to see to what extent you can, you can bring those in together rather than right. separating them and, and say, yeah, can we, as we go up the, the sensory to cognitive scale, sort of much more seamlessly blend from a, a localist to a more distributed kind of a representation. So, so perhaps that, that analogy of a binding as a, as a virtual neuron might, might be of some help. Mm -hmm. So maybe as a matter of clarification, so we, we do, uh, as we go higher to cognition, we um, don't always have these slow dimensional you know, feature fields. Mm. We uh, end up actually having what we call nodes, which would be small populations of neurons. And, and one yeah. thinks of them really as being embedded in ensembles that are all competing with each other. And that, you yeah. know, and that becomes sort of concept kind of um, operations. And, but still they, they are, you know, localist represented in a localist way. Again, you know, localist, but by binding, it is often you know a, a limited set of such localist representations that are connected. Sort of, it's, it's it's sort of a dynamic version of even Rommelhart McClelland, if you want. You know, the the, the 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 I would say the features that were considered then to be characteristic of categories were not necessarily you know these low low level high dimensional feature vectors they were actually concepts right and they were binding the concept so in a sense i think we're closer to that in spirit so uh, i would say the, the, the what you're sketching is probably a, a way you know that you're gonna come up with that that mirrors what we're actually trying to do that is we're trying to say the sort of things that you can write down mathematically in this a how would that work with these you know, local localized um, distributions of uh, you know, local representations? And um, you know, it's, it's so that there's some one can achieve some things more than more than maybe Julian showed. Now there's sort of more recent work that makes some steps, like doing compositionality, you know, very, 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 in, in still very simple context. Uh, but um, it's not. I think it, it doesn't really exploit the math of classical VSA. So we have to sort of reinvent that. that that's what we currently see. Uh, so it, I, I would say VSA ideas are sort of a guide for the kind of things we need to do. Um, we, we, it's much harder for us to do that. And um, so a hypothesis is that VZ is too powerful for the human mind. That that uh, you know, that the, the, the difficulties we find might be real, yeah. uh, but you know I can't can't be entirely sure. But but that's sort of an intuition that we have. That doesn't mean that in technology you might actually want to, you know, maybe one can do it differently. You know, it doesn't have to be exactly in the yeah. style of the nervous system does. Uh, but that's where we stand.
I noticed that uh, in one of Yulia's slides, uh, Yulia, where you had the slide showing the, the benchmarking that was being done at Intel, one of the uh, items you had there was um, constraint uh, satisfaction, I think, uh, mm -hmm. tasks. But I think that uh, <clears throat> the, the work in, in classic DFT, I mean, essentially the, my interpretation is you know, the, the most important part is setting up your, your local competitive fields. So it's, the, uh, it's getting those patterns of positive and negative interactions uh, to enforce the, you know, the, uh, the dynamics that you want. Uh, and I think that you know, where this will come to with uh, you know, the more cognitive stuff is once again, we, we, we may well be creating composite structures, but it's the, the, the pattern of interactions of those positive, of those composite structures with each other, enforcing some sort of a winner take all dynamics, which you know, probably is, is interpretable as a constraint satisfaction, which I think will be key to, the, to this work. Yeah, this is true that, that what is behind the constraint satisfaction is exactly mm -hmm. that. So there's a competitive dynamics with some noise that kind of explores the, the space created by those constraints and states. Um, right. Hey, so if we uh, turn this around and ask you guys a question. Um, so so uh, one uh, connection we see to deep networks is that in many of these networks that is actually always have some kind of bottleneck, some auto auto encoder kind of properties to, to force compression. There seems to be, you know, the notion that there are lower dimensional representations somewhere in the middle, they call these latent dimensions on, they are still mixed up, you know, they are not necessarily um, immediately open to a localist representation, but, but I could imagine, you know, that maybe somewhere there could be, you know, less uh, boring, uh, low dimension spaces in which we could construct localist activations that would have these properties that we need the stability and all that. Um, what I'm puzzling about is if something like that was true, or my question is, is there a, a tension between these sorts of insights that the neural representations that come from sensors are ultimately can be compressed and then have lower dimensionality? Is that a in conflict with um, the demands of DSA in terms of high dimensional vectors, which, which are largely, you know, reflect a lot of independent degrees of freedom. I would say that it's pretty contrary to the idea of uh, squeeze, squeezing like sensory input into very few dimensions. I, I think the other way of doing it is that you just, you just explode the dimensionality really I mean, project it into a very high dimensions and then do all the interesting things in the high dimensional space. And, and the other and so thing- So these high dimensions would be auxiliary. They, they don't have to be in the data. They are additional. Well, they are, they are still derived from the data. Uh, in, in other words, any sensory signal, in, in some sense, any sensory signal, if you want to integrate it with other signals, it has to be brought into the same mathematical space. And I think that that mathematical space has to have lots of dimensions, maybe you know thousands of dimensions. And once it has thousands of dimensions, you have a lot of nearly orthogonal dimensions that lets you lets you create new items that really interfere very little with all the existing items. And then you can you can you can do your computations yeah. uh, very but freely. It, but this sort of the tension I fear because when they you know you, they they don't interfere. But I thought that some of the power of the networks is exactly that they actually exploit co-variation and correlation and, you know, yeah, and association probably, and so on. Yeah, that's probably fine. That's probably fine. Yeah. I, 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 certainly the correlations also exist if you project the things into a high dimensional space. Correlation still exists there. Yeah. But but there's room for other things as well. And there's room for input from other sensory systems. That you might want to integrate with what you already have, or if you want to integrate integrate motor commands again, again, you you have to have a very very ample space in which you can do that uh, without interference, without interference. So, so my my hunch is that that projecting things into a high dimensional space somehow lets you do things that are very difficult to do in low dimensions. 
and it's not obvious, and it is it certainly doesn't correspond to how how we sort of perceive things and how things look to us when we talk about them. When we talk about something, we really have reduced things into very very, very few things. But but behind behind our ideas and thoughts, there's something something. It has to be something very abstract and something that really can be accommodated only comfortably only in a high dimensional space. So. Um, so, so I would say that that reflects my thinking, and there's yet, yet a lot of proving to be done. But but, but um, when you when you go through these bottlenecks that people do in 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 like um, uh, convolutional neural nets, in some sense, each bottleneck in in some sense you're extracting a few uh, principal components. And 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 it's just the it, it it's it's just the sort of a, uh, secret way of doing principal components. Right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so if principal components all you need, then that's fine. But but if you have to integrate with other things, then then and you need you need ample ample space where things don't interfere with each other. And there's another. Th thing and that is that um what brains seem to do brains really they i would say expand they expose the dimensionality if you have if you think of how many how many um actions come over 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 visual um uh, the nerve the, the optic nerve and then, if you look at how many how many neurons it activates, possi potentially activates. In other words, the total population of neurons that get potentially activated by the optic nerve, it is several magnitudes higher than the number of number of actions that come over the optic nerve. So, so brains they they actually very willing they explode the dimensionality, and then do the further processing in, in high dimensions. So. So, um, well, these are just feelings that I have and, and ideas that I, I work with. And, and uh, um, I just wanted to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you. I um, perhaps just, I think what I'm going to say is, is, is a restatement of what Penty said, which is using some different terminology. I mean, um, lately I've been thinking about um, dimensionality of recurrent systems and it seems to me that the and this i think gets back to your bottleneck uh, question uh, gregor that uh, the dynamics of these systems tend to be locally low dimensional but globally high dimensional so if you're considering uh, the current state of a recurrent system so you've got some vector defining the current state the dynamics of that system is essentially driven by anything that can happen that has a uh, appreciably non-zero dot product with the the current uh, state and the whole point about these uh, vsas these very high dimensional systems is that the uh, vast majority of the states of the system are quasi orthogonal to your current state so it basically means that the, the neighborhood which can have uh, an impact on your current state is a vanishingly tiny fraction of the total states of the system. So that you know, means you know, your dynamics is, relatively speaking, compared to the entire vector, um, low dimensional. But as the state evolves over time, it, it can move in any of the available directions. So it's like having a room that you're currently in which is relatively small, but it has millions of doorways out of the room. So you can, you can, you can go to a vastly different sequence of, of, of rooms from each of those ones. So, you know, I think you, you do, you probably get some sort of a bottleneck effect just from the, the dynamics being driven by dot products and by the non-zero dot products being constrained to such a tiny area around your current state. But you're going to need some other mechanism which has some control over 
how you navigate away, further away from that state. It's just if you're moving outside that, uh, you, you're dragging your state to look at different parts of the overall hypersphere. I don't know if that was helpful. It's a very interesting <laughs> point, uh, very, very interesting thought. Uh, if you, you know, if you're an engineer, you would just say, okay, I'll just uh, take these a coordinate system, you know, that, that points in this direction that this low dimensional dynamics now goes. And then uh, in a way you would have decoupled a lot of, if it was a linear system, you would say it's decoupled. So you, you can move in one direction and it doesn't really depend on all the other directions. It's not driven by those, as you say. Uh, it's less clear to me how that would be done in the nervous system, you know, when, when the vector actually consists of a lot of neurons and these neurons um, contribute to other dimensions as well. So how do how to imagine that that could be set up that the dynamics is then informed about that direction, right? I mean, essentially yeah. that's the, the difficulty that you have to have a yeah, coupling pattern know, that, that it knows about that direction. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, uh, I, I was thinking about this recently is that, you know, from, the from whatever your current state i mean essentially it's um it's only states which are known in your cleanup memory which which effectively have drive the dynamics and so only you know some number of those are going to be within the, the sphere of visibility of whatever your current state is um but all the potential states you could you know, possibly navigate to are effectively on the equator so if you're on the north pole that's your uh, that's your current state the vast majority of states are, are around the equator uh, and you need some mechanism which allows you to choose between those field dynamics to do something useful for you other than just stick within that tiny state uh, and unfortunately you know the the differences between different locations on the equator they're all maximal difference maximal dot product difference from your current <laughs> direction so there's there's nothing in terms of dot product that will distinguish between them. So there needs to be some other mechanism, um, which I mean, I've been banging on about this in different terminology for a while, the notion that just uh, what I've been calling dynamic similarity. So the notion that you'd use uh, some sort of a multiplicative operation to effectively reconfigure your space on the fly and bring things into uh, into visibility that, that, that weren't there before. Uh, but I mean, this is this is getting very hand wavy at this point, so probably not worth not worth wasting people's time at this hour of the day for you. But uh, in in my opinion, so this discussion is uh, definitely interesting to continue. So this is uh, so I I would like to encourage Gregor to attend more of such <laughs> of our webinars to uh, so that we can uh, keep on discussing these things and. Um, yeah, I know Julian uh, uh, tolerates very late meetings all the time. Maybe I can get myself to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, any more questions or co comments, contributions to the discussion? Well, uh, then I am looking at my clocks. So it's uh, quarter past eleven here in Europe. Uh, so I. I think we will wrap up today's webinar. So thank you once again, Julia, uh, for uh, participating, for being with us. And thank you all for the discussion. So have a great day uh, to those of you who still have a day and good night to all of us who have night in front of us. So. Thanks everyone, very nice discussion. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Julia. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.